I'm Bobby Murray. I'm the missions director here at Hosanna, and it's my privilege to share with y'all this morning. It's a Wonderful Life is one of the best films that was ever made. Just, just going to tell you straight up, if you haven't seen it before, you need to watch it. And uh, really, when I was thinking of examples to put before this message, because out of context, it makes sense on a, on a, on a service level, right? George is there. He's talking to Mary. What do you want, Mary? What can I get you? The moon? Wow, the moon. But it's going to make even more sense after we go through this message. So I tell you what, let's go ahead and pray real quick because I'm, I'm going to need some help this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy, for your love. God, for your love that you just lavished on us as your people, Father. On, on the love that you lavished on us before we were even your people, God. God, I pray that you anoint these words that come forth from your word, Father God, to speak to us, Father God, and be more concrete in our lives and help us to be better image bearers for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 But yeah, like I'm saying, I love that film. It's a wonderful life. I don't like old movies. I'm not an old movie buff. I'm not one of those people like, I just love those old movies. But that one I particularly love. Men, if you're looking for a film to watch with your wife, watch that one. You know, it's, it's, it's around Christmas and whatnot, but seriously, for an old movie, it's written from the perspective of a male. Because you see, so many of those old films are written from the female. Oh, romantic, oh, this, whatnot. We want our husbands to be Mr. Darcy and all this stuff. Well, It's a Wonderful Life is written from the perspective of George. It's about his hopes and dreams and how when things don't go right, that is still going to be okay. Right. Amen. Amen. So that is a beautiful message to us today, but we're going to keep that in mind. So this morning, I'm going to go a little bit in the air in depth of that about the, the moon and such, but really I wanted this message to be more along the line of apologetics than the one I preached previously was about the goodness of God and the faithfulness of God. Man, if you didn't get that, it's good, it's good for you because it, it's, it's where we're living right now, Amen. that God is good, Amen. right? Regardless of what happens to me, regardless of what happens in life, regardless of what happens in the world, God is good, and we can bank on that. And you may not believe that, but hopefully by the end of this message today, you will say, well, you know, maybe, maybe he is good after all. So what I'm going to talk about here is something a little bit. Let me read this to you here. Let me read it clearly because I want to be clear about this. Think about this. If. If God created everything then a loving, good, and noble, and relational God would make his creation reflect that. Let me say that again. If God created everything, then a loving, good, noble, and relational God would make his creation reflect that. Think about that for a minute. And we're just going to assume from the get-go that God did create everything, because it's true. I mean, this message could go in a lot more detail about you know, creation versus evolution and all that stuff, but we're not going to go there today, all right? I don't want to take you there. That's a, that's a talk for another time. And there's plenty of YouTubes you can go out and watch on that. We're going to talk about that. Um, let's see. Let's talk about, first of all, I said that if God created everything, we're going to assume that he did, then a loving, good, noble, and relational God would make his creation reflect that. Is God relational? Let's talk about that. Because we come to church, we tend to, make church, we tend to make religion churchy, right? We make Christianity churchy, but it doesn't have to be. Because if God created everything, then he's going to make his, reflect, his creation reflect that. And even reflect that relational aspect he has. Think about this. And here we talk about God being a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through all eternity. Think about that. Because for us, you know, we're born, we live a life, then we die, right? And that's, that just rinse and repeat. That's just over and over and over. Everybody in here was born. And then one day, unless Jesus comes back, we're going to die. And then people will carry on. But think about this. The Father and Son of the Holy Spirit have lived forever. Not lived, but have existed forever. Amen. Together. Think about that. Three, people, three persons hanging out together all throughout eternity. Talking to each other. Loving each other. Respecting each other. That, you have to get along. I mean, think about, when you know, I mean, think about your two best friends. Could you live with those jokers forever? Not just a little bit, not just a long time, not just going on a hunting trip, not going on vacation, but literally being stuck with that person for eternity. Because God is relational. He is love. We talked about this the last time, that God has always existed triune together in relationship with love of each other. So God is relational. He has, and what's more, he's not just relational with himself, he's extended that to us because he chose to create everything out of nothing. 
Does God need a relationship with us? Not really, but he chooses to have one. He chooses to go through great difficulty to get to know you. If you're here today and you're in question, well, does God really love me? Does God really care about me? Does God really know me? Yes. Absolutely he does, and we're going to go through this lesson, and hopefully you'll know more about that. So God's lived forever in relationship with himself, and he's for a period of time with us. And he's gone through great pains to make that relationship any stronger by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to do that sort of thing. So he has gone through great extent to do that. But let's look at this. He was relational. We look in the scripture, so it says, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. When Jesus said that, like, well, what are you, who are you, God? Who are you, Jesus? He said this, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. So he did that a long time ago. God is noble and reveals this in his creation. So God made everything. Let me read, read here from Psalms. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day he pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor there are words whose voice is not heard. Whose speech? The heavens. There is no speech, nor there are words whose voice is not heard. Their voice, listen to this, their voice goes through all the earth, and um, their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving its chambers, and like a strong man, runs its course with joy, is rising from the end of the heavens, and his circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing else is hitting from its heat. The heavens declare the glory of God. In other words, this, if, if they're doing that, the, what, we just have to look at the sky above. I love talking about, I haven't done this in a while, and I'm, I'm not going to do it today, but I love talking about wonder. You know, the wow-ness of God. Have you ever gone to the mountains? Gone to the desert? But there you go, there we go. Been on the ocean, been something like that. Look at the night sky and you just go, wow. That's amazing. Because there's something in us that responds to that. There's something in us that, in the, in us that responds to the beauty of a mountain, a mountain range. Or the beauty of a sunrise. Or the beauty of something like that. There's all that. There's something in us that cries out to that. That causes us something bigger than me put that there likewise paul says in the new testament for what can be known about god is plain to them (laughs) listen to this because god has shown it to them for his invisible attributes namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Now Paul says right there in Romans, he says, what can be known about God is made plain to them. Because God has shown it to them. Because he's shown it to them in his his creation. The creation, everything about creation screams out, I'm here. Something is here. We don't get something for nothing. What what makes a sunrise beautiful? God created it. What makes a mountain range beautiful? God created it. Man, you look on the microscopic level, you'll see all kinds of crazy things that we never get. There's stuff we never see. That's beautiful because God created it that way. Amen. Except that this doesn't make sense. So it says, the Bible says that we are without excuse because God has made it plain to us. His beauty, his majesty, his, 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 his attributes come through in his creation. This is known in apologetics as general revelation. In other words, God revealed in his creation is what we say from the Project Army. Now, it doesn't prove Jesus, it doesn't prove all that. It's not a proof, per se, but it says that general revelation will point to God. It's like a sign post. I made a quote a long time ago and said that life is the fingerprint of God. Where you look and you see life, you'll see God. It's true, because he created life. He created these things. He created, he created beauty just for our, our enjoyment, for his enjoy, enjoyment, excuse me. So general revelation, let's stay there. And talk to, now it takes something called special revelation when you talk about when preaching or from the word or you read it and all of a sudden a light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, Jesus. Yeah. Literally. 
Because before you can go back and say, well, you know, God, is that God? Is it, did God make it or did Buddha make it or Bahama make it? No, it takes special revelation that comes from God's word to say, this is the God that you're thinking about. The God that made the mountains, this is him. The God that made the seas, this is him. The God that created the night sky, this is him. And we learn about Jesus and we learn about God and we get all that detail through special, general, special revelation. But general revelation points to there is a cause that caused all this stuff to happen. There are mountains because something caused it. There is a sky because something caused it. There's all this stuff because something caused it. Now, man has gone kind of nuts and said, well, how can we do this? Because stuff doesn't just come from nothing. Maybe there's evolution, in it. And which is pretty funny because the evolutionary argument, that's the argument that says something comes from nothing, right? There's a big bang. Well, I love how Greg Kogel puts it. He says the big bang needs a big banger. You know, really, when you think about it from that, it has, it has to do that. So... General revelation, you know, God in his creation has a limited ability to talk about God, but it's a start. For instance, can a sunrise get me saved? Well, no, but if we look at the Bible, it tells us all about who created the sunrise. And it tells all the stories about suns and stuff and whatnot, and it's, it's beautiful. And matter of fact, you know, we're talking about this, we're talking about general revelation. You know, stay with me. In Genesis chapter 1, the very first thing, let's read this. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So the very first thing God creates is light. So what can we learn about this? What can we talk about light? Is light God? No, not exactly. But God created light. And he's going to reveal himself to us through that. Apologetic application here is a sidebar. Think about this. In this sidebar, you know, before I got into ministry, my goal career was, was medicine. And I had to go through P-Med, so I took a lot of science classes. And we did uh, work in evolutionary biology. And then in that, they were curious enough to give the first week, and then we're going to talk about creation. In the university, from an atheistic professor, here we go. You know, so we started talking about that. Now, one of the first proofs against Scripture, keep this now, this is not true, but this is where they go. They say, they say this, God doesn't create the sun until day four. But he created plants on day three. When you look at it in the Bible, and that's true. God creates the plants and does all the stuff on the earth. Then he creates the sun on day four, and all of a sudden they're like, well, what happened there? Plants can't live without sunlight. One thing we know, one of the most important things in biology is photosynthesis, right? Without photosynthesis, uh, from your farming community, without photosynthesis, life on earth dies. Because God designed it that way. But, you know, without that, when you look at it this way, you say, wait, God made plants first, then he made the sun? That doesn't make sense because the sun is required to make plants live because if they're just hanging out there, what happened? But it says on day one that God created light, but light is different than the sun and the stars and all of that. Because God created the sun, which is a star, and the stars on day four, but he created light on day one. So stay with me here. Let's look in scripture here. It says this. And God said, and this is the creation of the sun, and God said, let there be light in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them for the sign, be for signs and for seasons, for days and for years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights. The great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. To rule over the day and to rule over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there the, the, was the evening and there was the morning and the fourth day. So God doesn't create the sun and the stars and all that until day four. He creates light on day one. Then all of a sudden the sun makes light, but light is different than sun necessarily. Not all, all, not all the light comes from the sun. It's just the biggest source of light we can think of and the biggest source of light that we have that we know of, is beautiful, but God doesn't create the sun until day four. And he's okay with that, because the Bible says God said it was good, right? So for the Christian, that's okay, that's not a problem. For the scientist, atheist person that says plants can't live without sun, that's a problem. We're going to talk about that. Genesis states that light was created on day one. It does not list the source of that light. 
You ever think about that? They won. God said, let there be light. It doesn't talk about the source of that light. Because for us, the light comes from a light bulb or it comes from the sun. It comes from some sort of glowing thing, right? This is what Scripture says. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John 1.5. Jesus states of himself, again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the word, the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The holy city is described in Revelation, and the, and the city has no need, listen to this, and the city, the holy city, has no need of sun or moon to shine on it. For the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the lamp, and its light will be the and by its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut by day, and there, was, there will be no night there. Revelation chapter 21. The source of light is God. The source of light is the Lamb. God's given off light. And we see that even in, in, in Moses, when Moses goes to see him in Exodus. It says, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai... Listen to this. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with two tablets of the testimony in his hand, he came down from the mountain. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Think about that. Personal, you know, personal point to get in and talk with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them that all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. So Moses has been around God. Remember that story? We've been talking about that up the hill on Wednesday nights with the, with the link class, the fifth, fifth and sixth graders, which is a great class, by the way. I love fifth and sixth graders. This is a sidebar. You know, uh, we started a class three weeks ago. And it's been a hoot. And I love, I love junior hires, which makes me kind of crazy. Because people are like, oh, my God, you deal with junior hires? I can't believe it. I'm like, yeah, young people, y'all are great. You know, it, this, is the, this is the truth, though. Listen to me, parents. Junior high is one of those ages. It's the second biggest. I'm, I'm just going to say this as a sidebar. It's the second biggest group that falls out of church. Let me say that again. Junior high, 5th, 6th, and 7th graders are the second largest group that falls out of church. The first largest group is graduating seniors because they go to college and they party and go nuts and like, Jesus who? Girls, beer, whatever. You know, but junior hires, junior hires are the second biggest group that fall, the most vulnerable group in the church because they're just old, they're, they're just old enough. My son fits in that group. They're just old enough to throw a fit on Sunday morning. I don't want to go to church. I'm tired. I want to play video games. I got, what, what about this? And I love, it, I love it when they do this. I got studying to do. I got a test on Monday. All of a sudden, you're going to get up early in the morning and study your test when it's time to go to church. Why is that? Because there's a test demon <laughs> that tells him, hey, you got to study. All of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden he says, yeah, yeah, I got to study. But why? Because that's the, they're just old enough to stay home alone and to fuss about going to church and to get into trouble by themselves. They're going from a, pa- a parent-centric to a peer-centric viewpoint. When they want advice, they're going to go to their friends instead of their parents. They may still come to you, but they're going to go to their friends first. And their friends, depending on who they are, could influence them to do the right thing. They could be an iron sharpens iron, or they could just be a bad influence on them. So this is this group we're working with up the hill, and it's been great. It's been a lot of fun. We've been talking about when this whole thing about... Moses and God, when God appears to the children of Israel, and he does his smoke, and he does his lightning, he does his voice, and he freaks them out, and they're like, oh my God. He's like, I am the God who brought you out of Egypt. They're like, oh my God, don't kill us. So they're going nuts. But it's amazing because we're learning about how God is holy. We're learning about how God is merciful. The first thing in all of that, what God says is, I am the, I'm the Lord I God, merciful in nature. He wants, he wants to be known to the Israelites as a God who is merciful. Even though there's smog, even though there's fun, there, even though there's lightning, even though there's fire, even though Moses is glowing because he's been around God, God wants them to know that I am a merciful God. And that's a completely a sidebar. It has nothing to do with this message, but all that to say this. Parents, if you have junior hires, get them there on Wednesday night. We'd love to sit there and talk to them and teach them these things because they're at a time when the enemy would desire to sift them as wheat. We can't allow that. We won't allow that. Amen. Because there's a world that's trying to get them to stop, and they need to hear this kind of stuff. So, 
Anyway, Moses goes up and he sees God back in the message. God sees this. He gets around him. God puts him in a crack, it says, and he puts his hand over it and he walks by him and says, you can look where I was. He doesn't actually see God. He just sees where God passed by and that Shekinah is so powerful it gets on him and his face closes and it freaks everybody out. One of the attributes of being in the presence of God is that you end up glowing. I don't know what that is. I don't know why that's a miracle. It just says when you get in the presence of God, something happens. You start to take on that image. You start to take on that glow. You start to take on that light. Okay? More pressing, Jesus describes us as light. Listen to this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people hide a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So we learned that God is light. We learned that to be around God makes us glow. Then Jesus said, you're the light of the world. What does that mean? Are we light? Eh, No. But there's something else going on here. There's something else going on here. Think about this. What is darkness? What is darkness? Do we, yeah, it's the absence of light. Just like cold is the absence of heat. We don't go in a room and turn on a dark switch. Think about that. We don't think, oh, it's too bright in here. I need to turn on a dark switch. No, we get sunglasses if it's too bright. Why? Because we've got to block that. Let me show you this right here. This is kind of cool. I brought this with me just to show you. I'll give you a demonstration of darkness. This here was something I kick-started several years ago. I don't know if you can see that. Let me take the cover off. This is one of the darkest surfaces known to mankind. Why? Because they just wanted to make it dark, to make it cool, make, make make blackers black. If you know anything about graphic design or paint or anything, it's hard to get a true black to stay black. Because you would, we would all say, well, this is great, but that curtain over there is black. The shirts I have have black stripes on it, but this dot is darker than the black on this shirt. It's a dark black. How do they do that? Well, this is a man-made object. This is a man-made substance. What they had to do, this, this circle, this dot, and after service, I'll carry it around with me. You want to look at it closer you can. But this surface of this dot has is specially man-made. It is designed to be like a fuzzy forest on a microscopic level. What happens is that light hits this, and it bounces around in that little microscopic forest back and forth. It absorbs light. It can't destroy it. It can't eliminate it. It just absorbs light and keeps it from reflection. Because we know that color, we know that all that stuff is just light bouncing off of whatever and bouncing back into our eyeball on that, on that color spectrum. So blue is blue because light bounces off of it and reflects back blue light. Pink is pink because light bounces off of it and reflects back pink light. Black is black because light gets absorbed. How many of y'all had a prison when you were a kid? I still got one somewhere. You know what a prism is? That glass thing? I, I wish I would have brought it up here now. I think about it. But yeah, a prism is really cool, right? You get in the sunlight and you make a what? A rainbow. It's cool because all the colors in, in, in the visible spectrum are in white light which comes from the sun. So that prism comes in, the light bounces around in there and shoots out and makes a rainbow. So the way colors work, whatever, whatever that, that pigment or whatever reflects, that's the light you see that comes back to you. If it's orange, then it's orange light coming back to you. If it's green, it's green light coming back to you. So you understand that light isn't destroyed. It can only be absorbed or refracted a lot enough to a point where it, makes, where it looks dark. But you can still see this. It's not like it's, oh, it's invisible dark hole. No, you can still see that. That's kind of cool. But that took a lot of effort and a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of smart people, people, people smarter than me, to manufacture a surface that would look black as black, dark as dark. Who would use that? Probably photographers or something like that, or for whatever reason. But think about this. What is the greatest natural example of light that we can think of? I already said it. It's it's the what? The sun. Right? That sucker gets bright. You go outside on a bright day, you got to put sunglasses on. I hate when I go in the parking lot that's all concrete and that's that white concrete and you get like... You can't see, right? I remember when it, remember when it snowed, when it iced? It didn't snow, it iced. Remember it iced a few weeks back? My son walked outside and says, man, snow blindness is a real thing. Everything looks crazy. Because he, like, he likes to watch those shows with the Eskimos, and they put the, the little bone thing on their face that has a slit cut in it so they don't go sun blind. 
He's like, well, that's a real thing. I'm like, yeah, we don't have so much snow normally. It's not a big deal. But you no, know, the, that's the power of the sun reflecting off all that white around you and shining your eyeballs and making you see crazy. But what about nighttime? Or actually, let's... Oh, okay, here, I didn't, didn't put a space there. Can we watch that sunrise slide? Do we have that sunrise slide? There it is. All right. That's beautiful. That's amazing. Who did that? God did that. But what about the moon? Can we have the, the moon slide, if you don't mind? The moon slide. What about nighttime? What about nighttime? We have the what? The lesser light, which is the? The moon. So let's talk about the moon. Because we started, you know, this whole message to start off with that, that clip from It's a Wonderful Life showing the moon. Now, you want the moon, I'll throw a lasso around it, pull it to you, and you can swallow it, Mary. What is the moon? Think about it. What's the moon? And this, is, this, is, this is easy. This is elementary. I told Gary this is one of the most complex, simple messages I've, I've, ever, I've ever done. The moon is a rock. Think about that. The moon is nothing more than a rock, a big, big rock that floats in space. Can the moon generate its own light? Who says yes? Who says no? No. The moon does not generate its own light. Now, the sun does. The sun's like a bunch of nuclear explosions going off at one time forever and ever. Well, it'll run out of fuel eventually, but Jesus will come back long before that. But the sun generates its own light. The moon generates nothing. It's just a rock in space that does nothing. There it is. You see some asteroids have hit it on the side, but it spins just fast enough to where one side only sees it, and the back looks a lot more pitier than that because the asteroid is slammed into that, and it protects a lot of the Earth from asteroid impact. There's a lot. You can go into this. There's a lot of some beauty in that. But basically for today, we're going to say the moon is a rock, and it can't generate its own light. But the word describes it as a lesser light. How does the moon make light? What does it? It reflects light. I put here, the moon simply reflects the light of the sun. It functions like a mirror. Think about that. The moon is a rock. It floats in space. All it does is just float. What's it do in life? Floats. What does the moon do? It floats. The sun is doing all the work. All the light's coming from the sun. The sun is generating. There's explosions going off. It's super hot and whatnot. There's solar flares going on and whatnot. And all this stuff is going nuts. And this light comes across millions of miles and strikes the surface of this floating rock in space. And it reflects that light back to the earth and gives us great movies, quotes, to say, you want the moon, Mary? Throw a lasso around it and bring it to you. Think about that. The moon is just a rock. The Bible speaks of our relationship with God in terms of reflection. Did you know that? Let's read this scripture here. It comes from 1 Corinthians 13. When I was a child, here we go, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Now we see in a mirror dimly, especially back then. This is biblical time, so 2,000 years ago. So you're looking at polished brass probably. So the mirrors are really bad back then. Now you can go buy a paint and make any surface reflect. I want to make this finder a mirror I could. But back then it was that way. So now we see in a mirror dimly. But then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall be known fully, even as I have been fully known. 1 Corinthians 13. So now it's just like we're seeing a reflection. We see in a mirror. We see something dimly. We see our relationship with God dimly. We have a dim understanding of what God is, of what that relationship is, and what has truly happened to us. The moon is a rock. There's no life on it. There's nothing growing there. It's just there. It's just a rock that floats in space. Note that understanding that this is a mark of maturity. What's a mark of maturity? Knowing that right now you see dimly, then, then I'll see fully. That's okay. That's a mature thing because the whole thing starts with when I was a child, I thought like a child. Now I'm a man. I've got to put away childish things. We can only know God as his as his image bearer, but one day we'll see him in his fullness. We can only know God as his image bearer, but one day we'll see him in his fullness. 
The moon is a rock that flows in space and reflects the light of the sun. Think about this. See where I'm going with this? We can only know God as his image bearer. There we are, floating on earth. But one day we will know him in his fullness. Moses desired to see God face to face. And he is known as the prophet who knew God face to face. But God let him know that to see him in his fullness, like I tell the kids, would melt his face off. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And thou will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy unto whom I will show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So if we saw God the Father, we would instantly die not because he's mean, not because he wants to destroy us, not because that is his nature, but because... Again, if you liken it this way, there's no such thing as a dark switch. We talk about God being holy. We talk about God doing these things. We talk about Moses just seeing where God passed by, and he's glowing. It's the nature of God is holy. The nature of God is pure. The nature of God is just, yeah, we know God wants to be relational. He wants to know us. He wants to get to know us. He wants to show us who he is. But to see him face to face would kill us. But he went through a lot of trouble to send Jesus so we could be redeemed to him. So we could be a mirror. We could see that relationship with him in part. We could see it dimly as in a mirror. But one day we'll know him face to face. The moon is a rock that floats in space. Stay with me. In all this, consider this. Romans chapter 8 says this. And we know that for those... Listen to this. I love this here. And we know that, the, that for those who love God, all things work together for good. We talked about this the last time I preached. And we sung about it this morning. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In that he might be the firstborn, um, firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he also called, he also justified. And those whom he justified... He also glorified. God's goal for the believer, God's goal for you, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, is to glorify you. Right now you're being being conformed to the image of his son, and that's an ongoing process. That doesn't happen overnight. When somebody like, you know, if you're an adult, you know, you've been living 40 years for sin and yourself, and all of a sudden you get saved and you expect everything to be perfect. The next day it doesn't work that way. It takes a while for God to work that out of you. But that's okay because it's a completed work. It's a completed work. It's done. But it takes a, sometimes it takes a while to get there. Okay? Even sunlight, even though it's bright and powerful as it is, it takes a long time. How fast? Will just, Will just did a problem this week on that. It was like 1,800 and something miles per hour. That's how fast light travels. So even it takes light a while to get somewhere. Even though it's powerful, it's great, it does great things, it still takes a long time to get somewhere. Just like when we get saved, it takes us a while. We know through that word so-so, like Pastor Damon has taught us so well, is that the work is completed, but it's also ongoing. It's an ongoing process. The moon is a rock, okay? So God's ultimate purpose for us is glorification. But for now, we're supposed to be image bearers of the sun, Furthermore, read this. As a father sows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are but dust. I love that scripture. Because any time I get too full of myself, I can look at that scripture. God remembers that we are but dust. If I'm having a bad day, I'm doing stuff and stuff is not going my way and I'm not walking the image of Christ like I should be, I can look at that and remember that God knows I'm just us. You know what's amazing about that? Is that he chooses to love us anyway. Man, you know like when you're a kid, if you have kids and they go outside and they play and they play in the ditch and they get all full of fish guts and mud and frogs and whatnot and they run in the house and they look like little puppy dogs and they get that bead thing that grows. What is that? You remember that when you were a kid and you wear those and they got those little bee dirt that stick on your neck like from the dirt and the dust and stuff like that. But yeah, they come in and what do you do? You say, oh, you smell like a puppy dog and then you hug them. Why? Because you love them. You know they're just a kid. You know they're having fun. You know they're doing that, but you love them anyway. So that's how God feels about me. He remembers that I'm just dust, but he loves me anyway. I was like, oh, (laughs) Chad. Right? That's the picture of the Father. He knows we're just dust. 
He knows that we're going to mess up. But he chooses to love us anyway. He chooses to, 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 to bring us into fellowship with him. He's been in fellowship with himself for, for eternity. He chooses to have fellowship with us. He knows that we're just dust. The moon is a rock that floats in space. Do you see where I'm going? Science loves to tell us that we're stardust. Think about it. If you're a scientist and you don't believe in God, you're, you're really quite miserable. When you look at it that way, just a purely materialistic world is terrible because you have no hope. So what, they, what do they come up with? Oh, we're just all stardust. Listen to this. I got some quotes here. This is from Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan says, the cosmos is within us. Oh, think about that. The cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself. Carl Sagan. That's what he said. We're a way for the universe to know itself. So poetic, so beautiful. Neil deGrasse Tyson says, We are not figuratively, but literally stardust. And this physicist Lawrence Cross says this, Every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. Okay, Again, these are atheistic guys. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. So science loves to talk about, you're just stardust. You're, star you're, you're dust from the stars. And that's the best hope they have, is that they're made out of stars. The best hope that we have is that God created everything. In the first day, God said, let there be light. There was light. That God did all this stuff to point to him to so that we could get to know him. The whole point of all this, the whole point of all going through all this exercise and this difficult thing, this difficult message to stumble through, is that God wants to know you. And he set things in creation to point to that desire that he wants to know you, that he longs to love you, that he longs to do that. God said this. He remembers that we are but dust. Science says, oh, you're stardust. God says, yeah, <laughs> duh. The doy, you know, I made you. I made you out of the dust of the earth. It says that in Genesis, right? You keep reading down there. It says, God grabbed the dust, made a, made a, made a mud pie, made a madam, breathed, breathed the breath of life into him. That's, that's the difference there. You can be dust, and that's fine. We're not going to hear, we're going to talk about that today. But the difference is that God breathed his very breath into Adam. That we bear the image of God wherever we go. And here we go, kind of the linchpin of the whole thing. Let's, let's go back through what we talked about, because we, we covered a lot of ground here. It's something that's really simple, but very complex too. But at the same time, it's beautiful. The moon is a giant rock that flows in space. Really, that's all it does. It does a lot more than that, but it mainly flows and controls the tides. It does all this stuff. And it's, there's a lot of work you can go to, that, like you know, creation proofs and things like that, that are neat to read. Uh, we're not going to do that today. But for us today, the moon is a giant rock that floats in space. Number two, the moon has no power on its own to emit light. It's just a rock, so it doesn't generate its own light. It's, the Bible calls it a lesser light, but it doesn't make its own light. Three, moonlight is a reflection of the sun. Okay, an intense source of power on the other side bounces off the moon. Number four, God knows we are dust. Okay, moon's a rock, we are dust. Number five, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. Talking to Christians, you are the light of the world. Number six, God's will for us is to be conformed to the image of his son. Let me see that again. God's will for us to be, is to be conformed to the image of his son. Number seven, we have no power in us to do so. Think about it. The moon's a rock that flows in space. There's nothing in it. Can, can I... That's what the Bible was given. That's what the law was given for. Can I be good enough to earn God's grace? Can I be good enough to make heaven? Can I be good enough to save myself with all the stuff that's wrong in me, with all the stuff that's flawed in me? Can I ever be good enough to measure up to the standard that God sets because he is the standard of perfection? Can I measure up to that? No. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short. The glory of God. Everybody. 
Man, you you walk along enough, long, you walk along long enough, you're gonna mess up. Even today, even though I'm sitting here, I'm in ministry, I'm a, a pastor, I'm gonna mess up today. Probably do something stupid, or say something stupid, or act some sort of stupid way, or watch something I'm not supposed to. I mean, I'm not I'm not doing that, but I'm saying, given given enough time, we're all gonna mess up. We're all gonna fall flat on our face. There's nothing I can do in myself to make myself perfect like Jesus. So there's no power in me to to conform myself to the image of God. There's nothing in me that lets me measure up to Jesus. I can't see with my glasses on. (laughs) Number eight. Yeah, there we go. (laughs) We are simply to reflect the glory of God to a lost world. That's what it means to be an image bearer. Like the moon is to the sun, we are to the S-O-N, sun. We're just to reflect the glory of God to a lost world. The moon is a rock that hangs, in, that hangs in space, yet it reflects the sunlight and gives us light at night. And it's beautiful, and we write poetic movies about it, about throwing the lasses around it and pulling it down, and all this stuff like that. Because why? Because that is an image in God's creation, if he is the creator, that shows us how he desires to be with us. In summation, number one. God as creator has made his creation to reveal himself. And there's more examples than just this. This is just a simple one. Number two, we are image bearers or reflections of his glory like the moon reflects the light of the sun. That's all we got to do. Listen to that. I love this. This set me free when I was studying it. I was thinking about that. You know, God knows we're dust. The moon is a rock. Think about this. It just floats in space. It doesn't do anything. It's just there. The sun bounces off it. The sun's doing all the work. The sun's making all the light. The sun's doing all the stuff. It's just there floating. It's like, here I am. And reflects the light of the sun into the night and lets us see at night. That's how we are to be in juxtaposition with Jesus. Is that we're just image bearers. We're just reflections of his glory. And God looks through eternity and sees us not like we are, but like we will be. In perfection, his goal for you is to be glorified. Now, we got to put some effort. we got to do that. we got to work that out, and that's what sozo means. Even though that's a finished work, we still got to work it out on our own time. So I'm not saying, no, well, you can just go and be and do what you want. and you reflect. No, it's not that. It's not poetic. This is truth. This is reality. This is what we do, though. What I'm saying is to reflect the glory. Because you never think about, think about this. As a pastor, our desire is to equip you to do the work of the gospel. For everybody to have a smoke. Everybody, each one, reach one. You know, if, if we can use a cliche, cliche, I can't say it, cliched term. Right? Because, and all of a sudden, you, you feel that pressure, right? You're like, I need to show Jesus to people. I need to be a Christian. I need to witness. I need to do that stuff to, to bring people into the kingdom. But I, I, just, I, I can't do that. I don't know the Bible. I didn't go to Bible college. I don't read my Bible well enough. I haven't picked up a Bible in two years. But yet, the moon is a rock that hangs in space. And just reflects the light of the sun. You're a reflection of God's glory. You're an image bearer of Christ. God is going to complete that work in you if you let him. All God says is also part of us is to say yes. Let me keep going on this summation. Number three, our destination is to be glorified in and through his completed work. You are sunlight. If I can use that, if I can make a cliche term. You are sunlight. He wants to shine through us. He wants to shine through in those who will let him. Number four is this. He wants to shine through in those who will let him. See, a lot of times we try to make church difficult. We try to make relationship with God difficult. We try to make talking about God difficult. When really, his creation shows us that all we got to do is just reflect his light. All I got to do is love people. All I got to do is let God love people through me. Now, there's a lot that goes into that. I understand that. I'm not telling you that, oh, you should leave here and be perfect. No, that's not it. But I'm saying you should leave here and understand that you are perfect, that you are a reflection of the light of Christ. Because the moon is a rock that hangs in space and just reflects the light of the sun. We're dust. God knows it. Yet we reflect the light of the Father. That's all we got to do. It's a past thing. And the Sozo teaching will teach us that we can work that out in time. We can get better. We can study the word. We can get better equipped. 
And that's our job. We're, our job is to help, you, help equip you, to help equip you to go out and witness and be, be salt and light and be all those great things you talk about in the Bible. But you just got to be willing to do it. You got to say yes to Jesus. Every head bow. I'm going to close this in prayer. Dear God, I thank you, God, that you love us. God, I thank you that you're willing to use a rock. God, I know that the cliche is if you can use a donkey, you can use me, and that's true. If you can use the moon, to, the moon to reflect the sunlight, you can use me to reflect your son's light into this world. God, I thank you, Lord, that you've given us each a hunger, Lord God, to serve you, to love you. God, that you're, that you're calling out to us to get stuff from your word, to learn stuff from your word, to absorb stuff from your word, and not just absorb it, to, to reflect it back out into the people that are around us. God, I think that you set up creation in a way that it points to you. God, we look at the moon and say, well, that's a lot like me. We look at the sky and say, man, that's, that's beautiful, God. You gave me a beautiful sky to reflect your, your beauty to us. You know, it would be remiss of me to close this service without giving you a chance to pray or giving a chance to agree with us in prayer. And if there's anybody here today and you've been saying, man, you know, I've heard about God all my life, but it wasn't until the day that it made sense or something clicked or something like that clicked. If that's you, just shoot your hand up real quick, real quick. There we go. Amen. Amen. Tell you what, let's just all, let's just all pray together. Let's repeat after me. Say, Dear Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. I'm a sinner, God. I'm just dust, God. But you choose to love me anyway. So right now, God, I ask that you forgive me of my sins. Help me to reflect your light to others. In Jesus' name.